So yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about security at scale and, and what we've done to uh, get our security program up to speed, uh, given the size of the organization and the, the size of the challenge that we have. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been with Mozilla for almost two years now. Uh, I came from, before that, a finance and government background where we had lots of sites but no scalability and uh, no DevOps, no anything. We just had really nasty development practices. So coming into Mozilla it was a bit of a different organization for me. Uh, it was also my first position working with, uh, working in a very public environment where everything that we do is open and all of the secret security stuff that is normally never discussed by organizations will magically become public when we decide to go on uh, a tear in our bug tracking system and make everything public so that people can go and learn from it. Um, so the important thing to understand about Mozilla is that everything that we do is dependent on the team that we have, uh, whether it's Mozilla as an entire organization or the individual teams that we work in. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the security organization at Mozilla. Um, the way that it's designed, it's split up into two different groups. Uh, we have our security engineering team, which focuses on developing new security features, security fixes, and privacy features for our different product lines. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the different products and services we have in a bit. Um, and we have our security assurance team. I'm a member of the security assurance team working in application security. Uh, our security assurance team has 22 people on it, so it's a pretty good-sized team, and that's split up across operational security and application security. So doing th everything from network security monitoring to firewall configurations to policy development to security testing, all that fun stuff. Um, our security program is focused primarily on being integrated into the development lifecycle, interacting with all of our software developers, making sure that they understand the threats and challenges that they're going to encounter when they develop new applications, and making sure that they understand how to apply the different principles that Mozilla has, in, in particular privacy, as we get more into uh, applications that deal with user data. So uh, our security review process is pretty straightforward. There's nothing magical about it. We get engaged with our developers as early on as possible. We start working with them on doing security and architecture reviews. We take a look and do some threat modeling for applications that merit it. Uh, in other cases, we may just look at the type of data that the applications are handling, how they're passing that data around to different systems within Mozilla, and whether they integrate with, with third-party vendors that may provide different levels of support for us, whether it's somebody who provides uh, campaign management for marketing, or whether it's a service like the social API that we're working on right now that integrates fairly tightly with Facebook uh, as an as a, as a initial partner and will allow any vendor to provide web services that will integrate directly within the browser to provide a more uh, streamlined approach to how, we're, how social networking will interact with the browser. Uh, another service that we perform uh, usually in line with the security review but in certain circumstances like social API or uh, identity which is our sorry the Mozilla persona uh, service which is part of the identity team to which is a federated authentication system when we want to do a privacy review of these types of things we'll break it out into a separate review we'll run what is essentially a privacy threat modeling session against it look at all the different threats to user data how people might be abused how people might be confused by the system and make sure that we're being as transparent as possible about how those services function and the last part is we'll do uh, a lot of implementation review so this will this is where we get into the less fun stuff like code review looking for things uh, and all the interesting little uh, security testing activities that we get to perform. So this is where we start breaking out into using fuzzers to try and find different vulnerabilities. We have a dedicated team of, I believe it's up to six people now, that just work on developing new fuzzing technologies and fuzzing Firefox and all of our other products and services. Uh, in addition to that, we have security automation engineering. To yes? <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> we're, we're, one of the pro uh, and actually, this is something I usually announce at all of my talks, but uh, I didn't hear. So um, I'm a fairly informal presenter. So if you have questions at any point in time, feel free to jump in, ask them. I'm happy to expand on anything. And I meant what I said at the beginning. With the exception of unpatched bugs and personal data, we pretty much talk about everything at Mozilla. So um, our fuzzers are not open, though. The reason being is that they're really good at finding bugs, including in Firefox, and it would, it's one of those rare cases where being open with those tools would actually harm our users, because the people who could use our tools to find bugs won't necessarily report them to us. Um, and not only that, uh, a lot of the people who could use our tools to find a large number of bugs could, at that point, use them to generate revenue 
and from other or other bug bounty paying organizations or from other more nefarious groups <laughs> and then out, basically outcompete us on fuzzing just because we don't have unlimited resources to do fuzzing. So And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're trying to do. No, that's okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to try and build that security community, those trusted members that we can release these tools to. Uh, that's one of the objectives that we have. Um, we also do security automation engineering, as I was saying before, which is focused on creating new tools for developers to be able to use when they're doing security testing. Uh, we recently recruited uh, Simon Bennett, who uh, works on the OWASP SAP project because we wanted him to focus more on integrating some of the features and we also wanted him to help us build out some new security tools. So uh, since he's joined, we've managed to make some really good progress in int integrating new features to support testing modern web applications. So getting beyond just straight HTTP interception and getting into things like WebSockets. Uh, he, he's done some work with some Summer of Code students to improve how the, uh, the Ajax crawler works to make sure that it can actually dig deeper into modern apps. Um, and then, of course, the good old-fashioned manual testing, opening up the browser, taking a look through sites, and, and seeing what happens when you tamper with parameters and, and stuff like that. Um, now, that's a little bit about what we do. So as I mentioned, we have 22 people uh, that are working on security for Mozilla. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the size of Mozilla. First off, one of the things to, t to mention about Mozilla is that we are a not-for-profit company. We have a pretty decent revenue stream because we've done a good job of finding a way to market ourselves to other companies without necessarily putting our, with, actually without putting any of our user data at risk at all. Um, you can read more about how our finances work and stuff like that in our annual report because we're a not-for-profit, it's all public, so you can go and find that info. Um, it's, on, it's easy to find on the Mozilla web, web, website. So the way that our community is structured is we have a group of contributors all the way up to users. Now, our co co we call them core contributors, and these are numbered in the hundreds. Uh, we're at about between six and 700 employees or something like that. I don't know all the details. It was 600 when I started. It's a lot more now. Um, and these core contributors don't necessarily, th these employees aren't necessarily all of the core contributors. We have a number of people who we consider to be core contributors at Mozilla who either work in different organizations and those organizations pay them to work full time on Mozilla stuff. Uh, whether it's features for Firefox that are important to those organizations um, or whether or not it, or whether they just want to be good corporate citizens and, and support Mozilla and support Firefox. Um, in addition to that we have a large number of volunteers that are considered core contributors and the way we distinguish between those is that employees at Mozilla are basically core contributors ha who have the privilege of being paid for their work. So they, these core contributors have the same level of access to Mozilla, they have the same level of access to the staff at Mozilla in our, our meetings, and they're given a great amount of respect. So um, it's really important to understand that when I talk about these things, we're not just talking about employees or people who are, are paid to work on things. The next step is active contributors, and these are people who participate in different ways, like m maybe they just applied one patch, or maybe they found a bug and they're helping us to test that bug, or they participate in QA processes, or uh, a really big part of these active contributors are our, 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 our localization teams that help to make sure that Firefox and all of our other products work across all the different languages that we support, because we just wouldn't be able to do that without them. Then we have casual contributors who are people who report bugs and different things. Uh, and they do all, all types of different activity. These could be people who log on to support.mozilla.org and, and help out by explaining to people how they can fix problems they're having with Firefox or Thunderbird. Uh, they may be people who provide reviews for add-ons. They may be people who wrote, write add-ons. And then getting into, the, getting into the supporter level, these are people who have shown support for Mozilla in different ways, whether it's helping to promote the brand online through our affiliates program or being paid sponsors for Mozilla or people who have just made donations to the Mozilla Foundation. Um, and then we have our users, which are hundreds of millions. So it, it scales up pretty quickly as you step through each tier in the organization. And although we're really happy that our users don't frequently contact us directly about security issues, we try to respond when they do. <laughs> 22 people doesn't scale to hundreds of millions very easily. Uh, to put some other details into perspective, in addition to the core Firefox product that I hope all of you are familiar with, um, we also have a couple of other things. We have Firefox for Android, which 
although it behaves in a lot of the same ways when you're using it, it's quite a bit of a different beast because it has a different front end. It's written as a native Android application. Uh, it uses the same underlying layout and rendering and graphics components, but some of the features to make it work properly have been ported over to, uh, to Java and on Dalvik. Uh, I don't know all of the details. I'm not an Android developer. Uh, but we also have Firefox OS, which is coming out soon. Uh, we're working pretty hard on that, and it's a new mobile platform. So we're also focused on the security of that because we don't want to release a, a mobile platform that's insecure. Uh, we also support Thunderbird. Um, there's a lot of coverage in the press lately about the status of Thunderbird. The reality is it's an open source project, and it's continuing to move forward. So when we are asked by the Thunderbird team, we try to continue to support them as much as possible when they need a security review or if they have questions about how they should be doing something. So those are our two main client installed products. We have a couple of other little things that we work on here and there, but, uh, but these are the main area of focus. Then we get into our services. So we have uh, some, of the, some of these things I've already talked about, the Mozilla Persona, which is a huge initiative by us. This is uh, an objective for us to help to take back control over identity on the web and put it back in the hands of the users and allow them to break out of the dependence on Facebook or Twitter or what, uh, Google or whatever social online uh, social identity provider that people are relying on. Uh, we're really hoping it takes off in a big way. Um, I've done talks on this. You can find them on YouTube, and uh, all of the other people on the identity team have done talks as well. There's a ton of information about that. Uh, we also have our marketplace, which is how we're trying to kind of take on the walled gardens uh, that Apple and Google have built up. We're trying to make sure that as people move into mobile device development, they have options other than just writing an iOS app or writing an Android app. We want to make sure that the web continues to stay relevant, that HTML5 applications continue to be open. Um, so that's one of the steps we're working on there. We also have fi uh, Firefox add-ons, or addons.mozilla.org, which is one of our critical services because one of the key features of Firefox is its extensibility. So people want to come in, they want to know when they go to uh, addons.mozilla.org, they're getting reviewed, secure add-ons from a site they can trust because that's code that's going to run on their device. Uh, and then we have Firefox Sync, which was one of our first endeavors to handle user data. Firefox Sync takes basically a copy of your Firefox profile and copies it to all of your associated Firefox devices. And that includes things like uh, usernames and passwords and history and all of this really wonderful personal data that attackers would love to get their hands on. So we are a little bit worried about that. Uh, actually, we, we handle that pretty well. I can answer questions about that later. and. Uh, but basically, no, we have no visibility into that data, and we designed it that way. Uh, so, uh, and then in the little footnote, plus 132 other web services and properties. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of them. So it kind of puts things into perspective. Finding all the bugs doesn't seem so easy all of a sudden. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is find new ways to help our team members to basically uh, perform force multiplication. We need to be a lot bigger than we actually are in terms of our reach into the security, uh, in, into the software development lifecycle across Mozilla. Um, we need to find ways to integrate ourselves into the different teams. Because we have a lot of volunteers, it's really hard to go and shake a stick at somebody and say, you know, we are security, we're the gatekeepers, and you can't do that. It's, it doesn't work because all you do is scare off volunteers. Uh, it also doesn't help because those volunteers then go on and they basically talk poorly about the security team at Mozilla. So we, we want to make sure we're helping people and making sure that when we say that we shouldn't do something, we're explaining why, we're helping them to understand why, and most importantly, we're helping them to move in the right direction. We don't want to just say, no, don't do that. We want to say, let's do it like this and help them do that. So the first step uh, to handling security at scale is basically scaling up how you're doing security reviews. And the way that you can do that, the first way is to scale up your people. Now, the easiest way to do that is go and find warm bodies, but that's becoming harder and harder in the application security space because basically we're in a situation where any skill t uh, the, the uh, unemployment rate for skilled talent is basically 0%. Um, most of the people that I know that have gone out to look for work, it's taken them less than two days to find a position that they're interested in and have usually started a new job within a few weeks after taking some time off. So. Um, yeah, we have open positions too, so if you're looking, come talk to us after. <laughs> um, the other way we can scale security is by taking a closer look at how we engage with the different, uh, different development teams within the organization. The way that we traditionally handled it at Mozilla was through a program we called embedding. So basically, we'd go and take a look at all of these different programs that we have running in 
Mozilla. We take a look at the different products and services that are being developed, and we take a look at the different team members that we have available, and we'd slot them in and say, okay, you're going to do a security review on this, and you're going to do a security review on this, and you'll attend these project meetings. And then all of a sudden, Mozilla got really big really fast. Uh, we started expanding the number of projects. We have more volunteers. We have more people working on different things. We're outsourcing projects to different firms. We're, we have more third-party relationships to deal with the fact that we're growing quickly. So this model kind of fell apart really quickly uh, because we couldn't hire people fast enough to keep on top of things. I think at one point we were averaging four months between hires when we were trying to recruit people. So that's not a very effective way to grow your team. So uh, what we ended up running into is we have our OPSEC team and we have our OPSEC team and we have all of these different projects, but the we'd have one or two teams that had really good coverage. They'd have OPSEC people there, they'd have AppSec people there. We'd be really confident in the security of that. And then when we went back to take a look at things at the end of a quarter or after a period, every so often we'd be like, okay, well, we have these projects that have really good coverage, and that's okay because those are our high-risk applications. But then we'd look at this whole raft and long tail of, pro of, of projects that didn't have an OPSEC person or didn't have a, an AppSec person or didn't have anybody taking a look at it. And that's not really good. Um, I mean, we can deal with all the high-risk stuff and make sure we're focusing on that and, and taking care of those things, but at the end of the day, the high-risk stuff being secure isn't enough to make sure that we are secure, to make sure that we're being good curators of the data that users are sharing with us and making sure that we're doing a good job of protecting Firefox in order to be able to deliver a secure product to the user. So we kind of took this model and turned it a little bit on its head. Uh, we're in the process of doing this right now. We've got a, a bunch of different teams within Mozilla on board. And instead of having a security person embedded within each team, we are taking a project-based approach to how we're going to assign people to different projects, and we're requiring that each of the team members become a mentor to somebody in these different project teams. So we have uh, our addons.mozilla.org site has a group of developers associated with it. Instead of trying to find a person to slot in and attend all of their meetings, we went and we found a person that works on that project who has an interest in security, who wants to learn more about it, and we're kind of mentoring them. We're bringing them up to speed. And at the same time, our OPSEC team is doing the same thing. They're identifying people within the web operations team that are going to support this to be able to make sure that they're aware, that they understand that as they put this product from development into production, then we're going to be addressing some of these concerns. You had a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the problem is, though, is that we, we, we have to start somewhere, and the, uh, without building out this type of knowledge within the teams, we, are, we won't be able to move any of the security program forward. We're just going to end up being deadlocked trying to figure out what type of stuff is more important than what else in terms of spending our security effort. So what we did is we went out and found these people who are interested. We brought them into the fold. That We don't even have this program fully fleshed out. We just know that you know, this person is really good at security in this team. They understand these issues. Uh, so we're going to work with them and make, make them responsible for contacting us. And, and as we spread it out into different teams, as we build our spider web through the organization, we're making sure that these people are becoming more well-known uh, as security champions to be able to share their information within, different, within their own teams and be a resource that other people in the organization can come to as well so that we can move the responsibility for security out of our team and into the developer community. And that way we're focused on finding the issues that developers may not know how to fix, uh, finding some of the issues in the architecture, at the architecture level to make sure that we're dealing with the really scary vulnerabilities because at the end of the day, like a heap overflow, big deal. It usually takes about a day and a half for a developer to figure out what went wrong and fix it. So that's not a big issue. However, when we build a service for six months and have to go back to the drawing board because somebody overlooked uh, you know, a basic crypto thing and all of a sudden all of the development built on top of that is no good, that's a little bit more painful. So we want to make sure we're focusing on that type of work in the security assurance team and allowing our developers to build their knowledge, build their expertise. And, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools we're building to help scale even that effort out so that our developers can help with security testing and stuff like that. I'll talk about that a little in, in, in a few minutes. So our security champion program uh, is, as I mentioned, is built up of security conscious team members. Um, the goal here is to identify people that have already expressed an interest in security. We don't want to go around and, and tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, now you have to carry the security bomb. <laughs> and when things go wrong, it's your fault. That's not an effective way to build communities. It's not an effective way to build teamwork. Um, 
So usually what we've done is we've looked for people who are interested in security, people who don't have time or no, not, are not interested in working on it full time, but they want to dabble with it. They like to find cross-site scripting. Sorry, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> They want it, like somebody who wants to learn more about how cross-site scripting works, or somebody who's working on a templating engine and wants to make sure their their engine isn't vulnerable to cross-site scripting or any of these other issues they're concerned about. A really important feature when we're finding these people is that they, we we need to understand that they know their own limitations. Not because you know we don't think they can't be taught or they can't learn, but we need them to know when it's time to call on one of us to bring us into the discussion to make sure that we're properly engaged on high-risk decisions. And this is one of the hardest things to figure out, but uh, fortunately, Mozilla is filled with a bunch of bright people, so <laughs> most of these people are pretty, pretty uh, capable of, of understanding their limitations. Uh, and, and the important bit is that they, they're, they're passionate enough about building good, strong, reliable systems that security is a big part of what they want to, want, want to build into their system. <coughs> so that's how we are dealing it with it within our teams. The other uh, goal that we have is to try and build out our security community a little bit more effectively. Now, uh, I talked a little bit about the way that Mozilla is structured in terms of its community, that we have this like basically uh, exploding graph of who's involved with it. Um, the, for the security program, we have one point of entry into our, uh, our security community. That's our bug bounty program. It's great to have one. I think it's really important. And we get a lot of really good feedback from people who are working on security testing. And we have made, built some really strong relationships with really cool security researchers. And it's led to people joining our team and completely transforming how we do security testing. So it's a huge win. Uh, we've gotten a lot of value from it. But the problem is, is that it doesn't build community. It builds a silo where a bunch of people come in and we have a variety of different people who are working on that. Students who are learning about security and find out that you know if they, if they get lucky, they might be able to find a cross-site scripting bug in something and get a payday. Um, we also have people who are just wanting to try new attack techniques. So they come and they try them on our sites and services. And then they pop something and we, they get a good payout. They get to write a research paper out of it and the whole nine yards. Great. And then we have other people who just mine full disclosure. And as soon as they find out about a bug in a, pro, uh, in a product we use, they come and they file a bug and claim a bounty. So, it, I mean, we need to make sure that we're moving beyond basic bug bounty payouts as a way of building community. So the way we're doing that is creating pathways into our team for to build trust with these different community members. Um, it's, a lot, it, it's really hard to... Uh, trust somebody who's basically just an email address online looking for money until you actually interact with them, build a relationship with them, get feedback from them on what, what approach they take to file the bug. Um, and of course, there's a big problem because a lot of these bug reports are coming in from China or, uh, or South Asia or Eastern Europe, where most of the people on our team primarily speak English. So we're, we're trying to overcome some of the, those language barriers. Uh, we have a few people in uh, that are either community members or uh, or direct employees that can speak languages, so they'll act as intermediaries and stuff like that. But we're trying to make sure that as we grow our team, as we grow our community, we're doing it in a way that's as inclusive as possible because a lot of the places that are up and coming in terms of researchers are, are not using English as their pr first language. And sometimes explaining the intricacies of these technical issues can be challenging if you're not speaking the same language. So we're also looking to find new ways to encourage contributions. We want to provide um, researchers who are interested in finding new ways to fix these problems, better visibility into the types of, of security issues that we're running into. So uh, researchers who want to find new ways to work on different security features that Firefox is trying to implement or other browsers are trying to implement can come to us and as we build these relationships, we'll be able to give them access to bugs that haven't necessarily been fixed and help them learn how to implement those features in our platform and it'll be a benefit to them because they'll learn and it'll be a benefit to us because we'll get people working on these issues that are really hard to solve. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people who've been trying to work on things like SSL certificate verification and, and how you tr determine trust for CAs. We need to have those people working more closely with us or we're not gonna win because all these people who are coming up with these really great ideas are not working within the browser community directly, so they don't have the ability to iterate quickly and test some of these ideas. We need to figure out ways to bring them into the fold so that we can try to solve some of these really, really gnarly problems. 
Um, the other thing too is that because Mozilla is focused on contributors uh, as opposed to employees in terms of responsibilities, the security team needs to be able to give up some of the responsibilities that we have and trust community members and not just on the application security level. We want to build out a more effective security monitoring program and there's no reason we can't trust volunteers to do it. Most of what we do is open. We don't handle very much user data, so we might want to trust to keep that user those user data related systems on a separate monitoring system that are in a in a tighter sphere of security. But we need to trust other people who we would normally trust to commit code to Firefox or commit code to our web applications. If we're giving them the ability to run code on our servers anyway, we should be able to talk to them and get them involved in our security monitoring capabilities and stuff like that. Uh, we also want to foster new s research and development projects, whether it's focused on new tools, new testing techniques, um, new training materials, new documentation, all of these things. We want to find all of these different ways to get contributors involved and we're looking for feedback from all of the communities, whether it's OWASP or Mozilla's community or the security community or guys who post nasty stuff on full disclosure. We're open to feedback from anyone, it doesn't matter. And then of course for the people who really shine, we want to hire them. <laughs> so we want to grow our team and get them involved and make sure that in addition to letting them research and work on what they're interested in, we're also channeling them towards solving some of the problems that we have at Mozilla. <coughs> so one of the biggest challenges that we have is in how we recruit volunteers because it's, it's, it's really easy to say, you know, we have this position available and listed on different career sites and tweet about it and post it on LinkedIn and all that fun stuff and eventually people will come in and trickle in and eventually we'll find the right candidate and hire them. But we need to build more ways for community members to get engaged because at the end of the day th we're competing with other vendors on identity protocols and those organizations are orders of magnitude larger than Mozilla. They have budgets that have like three or four or five extra zeros after them in comparison to our budget. So the way that we're going to win at some of these things, whether it's making sure that the web stays open through implementing new features on Firefox or building new identity protocols or building open marketplaces, uh, all of these things, we need to rely heavily on growing our community of volunteers. Um, so we're looking to coordinate with uh, academic institutions. One of my colleagues on the security team, uh, Mark in the UK, is working with some of the universities out there to try out, get our materials into, their co into the courses in universities to make some of the work that we have available so that university students can get engaged. I'm doing the same thing in Canada, uh, working with universities on the west coast and hopefully uh, expanding that out to you know, eastern Canada and getting more people more engaged. We're trying to do some of the same things here in the United States as well. One of the other aspects we're trying to work on is building out individual and community memberships, or not memberships, mentorships. Um, we want to work with individuals who have good ideas or have good initiative and help them to make sure that they're on the right track. We want to provide them guidance, provide them the resources they need. Somebody might have a really great idea on how to implement you know, uh, a new type of network security monitoring system, but they don't have the infrastructure or access to the right level of traffic or data to be able to analyze that. We can spin up a CTF event in three months and collect a whole pile of data and give it to them so they can analyze it. And that'll, you know, we, we have data for those types of research projects just sitting there. We have a network security monitoring that handles, you know, uh, potentially hundreds of millions of users when certain events happen, like when we release a new version of Firefox. So there's tons of different ways we can uh, coordinate with different groups that want to do this type of research. And then, of course, we have the more simple, streamlined ways. We, have, we produce a list of features, submit it to Summer of Code, and, uh, and, and Google and, uh, provides access to interns. So they provide funding so that people will come and work with us and help us work on uh, open source projects. That's how we got things like WebSocket support into Zap over the summer. We have uh, something called User CSP to help people understand how they can implement content security policy. All of these types of things are coming out of Summer of Code style projects. And then the, uh, the last bit is building tools to help us get more scalable. Um, one of the big challenges we have is finding ways to allow our developers, allow people who aren't in the security team to be able to effectively perform security testing. And it's not just about our developers either. We have, a, we have dedicated quality assurance teams that work on our products and work on our, our, our websites and properties. So one of the challenges we've had on the web side of things is that our uh, web developers will write unit tests, they'll write test cases for certain things, but they won't necessarily write test cases for all of the potential abuse cases. So we wanted to create a tool that was extremely simple that would allow some of these things to be implemented, 
the, in a repeatable fashion. So they didn't have to customize a whole series of different security test cases for their application. Uh, they could just run this tool against it and get some of the basic stuff. So we put together this tool called Garmer. It's a, a simple little Python script. Um, it does some basic checking. It has a plug-in model so that you can extend it, add whatever features you want. Um, we designed a feature for it so that if you have really complex checks that you want to implement and you want to do it like this, things, for example, uh, stepping through the every stage of an STS upgrade to make sure that it's handling prop ha handled properly according to the spec, you can actually implement that by chaining on events for failure and success and reporting back those results. So the way that it works is you write your individual checks, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. I don't know if you guys can see that there, but like basically that little line of code, is, is that little chunk of code basically looks through all the different headers and makes sure that there's an STS header available in the, requ in the response from the server. Um, it does, these are, this is implemented as a passive check. Passive checks are implemented so that you can, they'll be run against every request that Garmer makes and then reports back on whether or not the properties that you're looking for are there within the response. Uh, and they can be used for implementing things like mixed content checks, uh, looking for individual headers, looking for things like cross, uh, sorry, uh, X-frame options, headers, things like that to make sure that they're all, uh, all there. Uh, and these get run, un uh, unless a plugin is configured not to run them, these get run on every test that's performed. So if you implement it in one, you don't have to worry about implementing it across every other active check that has been implemented within Garmer. It automatically gets included in the list. Then we have active tests, which are a little bit more complex. This is a content security policy header check. And it's a little bit more complex. It actually looks to make sure that there's a content security policy available and that uh, if it is there, that it makes sense uh, at a high level about whether or not the policy is going to get pro uh, processed properly by the browser. Um, this check actually needs to be updated because there's been some changes to how Firefox is going to handle content security policy configurations. Um, and of course, it's also an evented check. Uh, a few lines into the de definition, there's a pass event that allows you to trigger an additional check to actually pull back a copy of the policy and store that in the results. Garmer is designed for extremely simple checks. We want developers to be able to, cut, to create new checks very quickly, to be able to execute them, and to have that integrated into all of their other unit testing that they might perform. So it can be included in, in Jenkins, but we also wanted to uh, provide it as an alternative to setting up a complete environment like Selenium. Um, if you're not a QA tester or if you're not using tools like Selenium on a regular basis, it can be a bit painful to set up. Um, and, and, and we needed to be able to run these tests across all of our sites very quickly. The only problem is uh, that we didn't have uh, the level of adoption. Developers are aware of it, they are, are interested in it, but like every other person who's working on anything in, uh, in a fast-paced environment, they just don't have time to go and implement all of these different sets of checks. So we've been slowly building on the number of checks available and stuff like that. We're also building some new features into it. Um, OWASP published uh, a, something called the Data Exchange Format, which it's a little bit clunky and we're working on revising it, um, but it provides a standard format for how you're going to record the output of network and application security tools. This is really important because we need to build up better interoperation capabilities so that we can do repeatable testing and get those results in, uh, in, in a usable format. Um, we're, the focus that we have on looking at this format is adding support for JSON because the, a lot of the more recent unit testing tools and stuff like that are starting to output that so it's less like the JUnit XML style results uh, and, and more flexible result formats. So if we can get this in place, have support for JSON, and then additionally, add checks for all of the modern web security features that we look for in a, uh, in a web application in terms of configura configuring the browser, uh, setting things like making sure that all the cookie flags are set appropriately, making sure that content security policy is present and it's actually got a policy instead of just a reporting policy, um, looking for X-frame uh, X -frame options, STS, all this fun stuff, um, and also looking at cores and how that's set up. Um, as we get all of these features in place, we'll be able to build on top of that and use it in, and get it better, more tightly integrated with our QA folks who may not necessarily have the ability to do the software development that's needed to get the test cases written. This requires no skill on the part of the user. Zap, in order to use Zap effectively, I mean, you can point at it and tell it to do a scan or a fuzz, and it'll generate some results, but you still have to be able to interpret those results. You still have to be able to configure it properly. With this, you run Garmer from the command line, and you provide it the URL, and it'll spit out a report of whether or not all of the test cases have the 
have passed or failed. It's an incredibly simple tool. It's not designed to be a replacement for any other security testing. It's simply designed to give us a basic tool that our developers can run and know, you know, we've got all of these features in place, and so here's your Garmer report when we file our requ a, review, a request for a review of an application, so you can see that all of these basic things that you're going to look for are already taken care of, so you can actually focus on important stuff. Because as basic as STS is, if developers don't think about it when they're writing their code, they're not going to include it. With a lot of these bra modern browser security features, they're opt-in. The developer has to put in code to trigger them. Content security policy doesn't happen on its own. Uh, X-Frame options doesn't happen on its own. Um, when it's available in Firefox, uh, iframe sandboxing won't happen on its own. If, if we don't have checks in place, the developers won't do it. Um, not because they, uh, out of malice, just because there's too many different little things that they have to tick off to make sure that it's done. So this is meant to supplement some of the other tools like Zap, uh, which is an absolutely powerful tool and we, we, we love it. That's one of the reasons why we hired Simon. <laughs> um, so we, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this tool fits into another tool that's going to compete with how developers might do security testing. Yep. No, not at all. That was, that was the big distinction. We did not want a framework that was going to require configuration and setup. It had, Garmer has extremely narrow dependencies. It relies on the Python library requests and another library called Beautiful Suit for HTML parsing. That's it. No, it does not. It's, this is designed to look at the request and response bodies and make determinations based on that. So the next tool that we're working on, and we were hoping to have this ready for, uh, for this conference, but it's not quite ready to go yet, mostly because as we dig deeper into it, it's, uh, it's, it's not as easy to implement as we thought. Um, but that's okay because we're making really good progress. So what we have is all of these developers who are working on all of these different projects, we have all of these different tools that are available, but we don't have the time or resources to educate all of the developers on how to use these tools. Now we as security folks know that there are uh, basic choices that you make when you're configuring a tool. If you know you're scanning an application uh, using AppScan or Skipfish or Zap or any other dynamic testing tool, there's certain options that you're just going to want to make sure you have there. You want to make sure your authentication is configured, stuff like that. So what we decided to do was create this framework that will take all of these tools, have plugins for each of them, and have same configurations, and then have the ability for a developer to simply log into a web application, go and click on a new scan, Yeah. This is why I went with screenshots. Oh, shoot. That's why I went with screenshots as well. So this is using pers uh, Persona, so you can log in with any, uh, any Persona account. It won't actually let you do anything if you don't have a Mozilla account um, right now. That's easily fixed if you download the source code and, and deploy it yourself. Um, but you log into it. And you go in, and for a developer, all they have to do is plug in the URL, and it'll run the entire battery of tests with all of the configurations that we specify as being something that's relevant for a vanilla web application. Um, the kicker is that basically this, is, this web interface is designed to take away all of the complexity of setting up the tools. It doesn't mean that you've lost all of the complexity of the tools. Um, there's additional options, and that part is coming soon, but one of the biggest blockers for us was defining a way so that we could abstract away the configuration details for each of these tools. So when you drop that down, if you're doing a scan of a website, when you go in to type in your authentication credentials, it asks for your authentication credentials in one way. If you want to configure how a fuzzer is going to work, it's abstracted the way that fuzzers are configured for Zap and how, how Skipfish is configured as well, so that the options that you set are only set once, and they're, ex they're interpolated by the individual plugins based on those option settings, and the tools are invoked with the advanced options. So developers who want to dig in and try to get more things set, uh, want to set things more accurately for their application have the option to do so. And more importantly, if a security professional walks into Minion and starts using it, we can do all the fine-tuning fine, uh, fine we want of the configuration to get the results we're looking for. Um, so 
I want to talk a little bit about the architecture. So we're aiming for a, we were aiming for a full release of this week. Uh, unfortunately, the releases don't always work out the way that you expect them to. But we do have uh, we have a bunch of documentation. The source code is available on GitHub. Um, we have a couple of functioning plugins. The plugins don't work properly through the front end yet, but they do work. You can invoke them from the command line. Um, and basically, the way that Minion works is it has a web interface that talks to a task engine. And this ta ta task engine uh, mediates between all of the different plugins. Now, each of these layers is implemented through a REST API. The reason we did that uh, rather than just having a, a monolithic application was because we know that security tools don't all run on the same platforms. You might have uh, AppScan only available on Windows. You might have some security testing tools that are only available on Linux. Or you might have some other tool that's a third-party provided service and you need your plugin to wrap that. For example, um, it's actually very easy to write a plugin that will take uh, an, uh, configuration settings and translate that into something that might be appropriate if you have like White Hat's on-demand scanning service or if you have uh, you know, a, a tinfoil account or something like that. You can actually can figure out plugins to do all of this very easily. Um, and then the initial version of Minion is designed to do all of this, collect all of this information and dump it into a repository so that when developers are running their scans, they get a clear report of the issues that are found, but only stuff that we as the developers of Minion consider to be uh, moderate or higher risk issues. So things like cross-site scripting, things like uh, SQL injection, um, missing configurations for browsers that we are concerned with, stuff like that. But all of that is going to be tunable through the configurations. So it's not going to be tunable through the interface, but so you'll have to have a little bit of knowledge when you're setting it up if you want to fine tune it for your organization. But it's something that you can do. <coughs> the, uh, our goal, and, and this is the, our, our goal for Q1, is to get all of this working, to have the basic reporting infrastructure so that developers can go in and see their results. And then when the security folks come in and say, hey, let's start the security review of your project. Instead of having to start from scratch and, and learn all about the application, they can come in and take a look at all of the results. And Minion stores all of the raw results of the tools that it executes, as well as the interpreted results that it presents to the developers. So a security guy can come and pull the Nmap report, or pull the Zap report, or pull the Skipfish results, and take a look through everything, and see if there's something that a developer may not be aware is an issue, or may not understand, and work to educate the developers if they're interested, or just take that away and you know, file bugs in the bug tracking system or whatever the case may be. That's the first step. The direction we're going with it is basically um, we're tired of seeing all these really cool tools and services be developed by these application and security as a service providers. So we want to create an open source framework to allow any team that has a few ap application security people and a few network security people to set up an, either an internally or publicly facing application as a service, or sorry, security as a service provider. We want the ability to run all of these tools, to have all of this recording and tracking, all of this done and implemented in an open source product. Uh, we want to do it with standards that are published and managed by other open source groups. And we want to do it as a Mozilla project because Mozilla's open source. Uh, even our tools, like all of our fuzzers, you asked about those, they are intended to become open as soon as they, it becomes safe for our users to release this, release them. These types of tools, th this is open source immediately. We want uh, all of the tools that, are, that it supports to be open source tools, but we want people to be able to extend it to support whatever tools that they've made an investment in. I mean, you can, we, we're going to have a Nessus plugin, but we're also going to implement a Rapid7 plugin because we have a Rapid7 license. We're going to implement uh, you know, HP on-demand scanning because we use their on-demand static analysis service. And same thing for Coverity, ScanLadder. And anybody we integrate with, we're going to build plugins and publish them for. But we're, we want to get feedback from the community on what they expect from this. We want to build this tool out and make it available for everybody so that they can grow their teams and basically build up their security program at the same time as we're building these tools. The, uh, in, in the original planning session, what I said it would be really great is if we could get in our initial kick at the can, get uh, three tools up and running, and then by the end of next quarter have 20 or 30 different tools, and then basically find a way to incentivize the community to go around and wrap all of the different tools that are deployed in Backtrack um, and make it make a simple to use wrapper so that people can quickly implement plugins for, uh, for Minion to be able to run those types of checks. Right. That would be great, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is something that's been needed by the security community for a long time because we, we, we can't scale up at the same rate that 
developers and attackers are finding new ways to create new problems, and, and attackers are finding new ways to break our applications and services. So this is kind of, we're hoping, we're actually betting that this is going to give us an edge in all of those cases. It's going to allow us to work more tightly with our developers, allow them to do the work for themselves, and allow us to uh, have a warm handoff when we actually start looking at a project to do security testing of it. So this is the direction of how we're going to deal with scaling security in the future at Mozilla, and we're really keen to make sure that as we do that, we do it in a way that helps the entire community because it doesn't help us protect our users if we're the only ones who are secure. Patch is accepted too, by the way. If you take a look at the source code and you see something that we're doing wrong or you have some ideas on how to implement it, I know I already talked to some of the Gauntlet guys yesterday. I, I believe that was one of the Gauntlet guys who was talking, but there's a big bright light over your head. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had mentioned last night, I actually see a possibility for, uh, for Minion to incorporate parts of Gauntlet or Gauntlet entirely because Gauntlet makes generate, with, with its Gherkin format, Gauntlet makes it really easy to implement repeatable test cases. So if we can find a way to have Minion export those Gherkin file formats to redo a test, it makes it really easy for developers to, to run it locally instead of having to rely on Minion. So they can do things like debug their application while they're running those tests. So I, I definitely see an opportunity to collaborate there. I can't see that sign at all. Okay, cool. Well, that's it. So if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm the guy in a bright orange shirt walking around. So, Thank you.